of those resources that are available? How do we uh, ensure the engagement in the programs that have been made available? And let's start with you, Lisa. Um, a couple of things that we are trying is we are uh, contracting with local community organizations that work in the neighborhood that off offer other services that can be viewed as uh, trusted mentors when they refer people to our program. Um, we're also, uh, although government is slow, we're trying to embrace social media. And so uh, targeted Facebook ads have actually uh, been a pretty good bang for the buck in getting people uh, to come and contact us. And one of my community groups is uh, going to be pr producing some TikTok videos to uh, get at messages out about uh, asthma and lead poisoning. Great. And Jen? Sure, thanks. So one of the things that we do with programming, uh, there's usually a robust community engagement process around that, uh, where we try and get diverse groups in the community to participate in the planning process, you know, prior to, to roll out on some of these things. And we use a lot of the tools that Lisa had mentioned online, social media, all of those things. Um, so that, that's pretty standard. One thing that we're in the middle of doing right now, um, we're actually doing a race equity initiative in the city, uh, and it's a, a public polling process to ask residents how we're doing. Uh, is there equitable access to the city program services and amenities? You know, where can we improve? How can we better communicate with you? So kind of getting that feedback on, you know, what we've done before, is it working? How could we improve upon it? So Jen, when you were speaking at the beginning, you mentioned, you mentioned some best practices and metrics that your city uses. Um, Lisa, you, do you have any similar um, ways of sort of tracking the success of the work that your area does? Uh, yes, um, the city does it a, a couple of different ways um, for putting it out for the public. Uh, we've used uh, Tableau to develop a lot of uh, dashboards. So if you go into the city's webpage and, and look up different things, um, there's a lot more uh, data transparency that's available out there where they're putting out dashboards. Um, the, we also, um, all the departments are required to give annual reports to the, uh, to the city council. So um, Results Minneapolis is one of the latest iterations of that. So looking up uh, those documents can also give people information on some of the, the broad areas. Um, I do want to boast a, a, a little on, I think uh, Minneapolis has been very successful in reducing uh, the number of lead poisonings um, over the last 20 years. Uh, when I started there, we were having three over 300 children a year poisoned at, uh, at 20 micrograms per deciliter. And now at 20 and above, we're having 12 a year. That's not good enough. We need to bring it down, but progress has been, been made. And so that we try to put that information out there too, that these are not hopeless causes, that if you take action, uh, you can. And one of the actions that I would like to see uh, more uh, cities take is, is investigate those lead poisoning needs at five micrograms per deciliter. Uh, which is what we're doing now, because that's cutting it off at that low level prevents that downstream a uh, higher level of lead poisoning. Both of you work in communities that are known for your large Somali populations. Um, and uh, one of the questions is um, what type of accommodations has your city had to make um, to, uh, to um, better serve immigrant communities, um, whether for their cultural practices or for communications. Lisa, I'm wondering, since you're Minneapolis is further along in the assimilation process, do you have a couple, a couple of examples of some things that may have been done differently to, to uh, work with different um, ethnic communities? Well, we um, have access to translators to do it. We make a practice to try to uh, hire a diverse workforce to reflect our population. Um, one of the bigger things I think they did is they redid uh, a few years back, they redistricted 
um, the lines for the wards so that there would the population would be in one ward that we've now had um, Somali council members. And I, th I think that was a, a, a big show of how committed we're trying to have representation where it matters um, in the decision-making process at, at a very high level also for our communities. Any, any concrete examples of things that you're, that you're aware of that maybe be being done differently in working with some of these communities? Um, we provide translated materials. We go out uh, directly to the neighborhoods to talk. So it's, it's Somali community, uh, immigrant communities are not new to Minneapolis. So right. as every new wave comes in, it's like, oh, what worked with the last time we yeah. had a new wave of immigrants, let's do that. And what lessons did we learn? And let's do it better this time. Okay. Jen, you're a little further up the chain in terms of um, immigrant assimilation. What, what, are, what are some things that you might be aware of that Eden Prairie has done to um, work with um, immigrant communities? Sure. So I, I think one of the things that uh, they're trying to do is work on having service delivery more accessible. So, you know, as we had kind of talked about, maybe some people aren't comfortable coming to City Hall. So having sort of satellite locations where uh, they can meet for services. Um, certainly, you know, that um, I think the mall is one of the places where we have some of these services available. So it's kind of a place in the community that everybody feels comfortable coming to. Um, and then they have a variety uh, of interpretive services through, through that program there at the mall. And that focuses around housing mostly and housing support services. Okay. It's kind of a philosophical question. Um, I think probably related to some of the conversations about the um, differences between wealthier versus uh, more impoverished uh, parts of the community. But I guess in your opinion, to start with you, Jen, um, are housing costs too high or are wages too low in our communities? Well, that's a softball, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's probably a mixture of both but wages, in my opinion, certainly have been depressed um, for quite a long time. So to me, that feels like the bigger area where we could see some growth in opportunities for people. Um, but housing prices is kind of right up there as well. Lisa, your thoughts? Um, I, I would say it's both. Um, one of the s striking things um, in Minneapolis is in the wealthier neighborhoods, the rent may be almost the exact same as the rent in a dilapidated property in the most um, economically stressed neighborhoods. And you would think the rent would be cheaper there, but it isn't necessarily so. So I think the city council um, made a really uh, good change when they said you can't, you can't discriminate against uh, the Section 8 vouchers, which a lot of landlords, that's why the poverty was being so concentrated in certain neighborhoods, because those were the only neighborhoods uh, where the landlords were accepting those vouchers. And we were talking a little bit about how what does somebody do when they get that tag on their, their record that they, they didn't pay rent? They wind up renting from landlords that don't maintain their properties because those are the landlords uh, that know the people are gonna be, they're so desperate for housing that they know that they don't have to maintain their properties in order to get that rent money. You both hedged that question really well. Um, that was a tough question to kind of throw at you. So I think you, you covered that really well. Um, Combining a few questions here. So across the spectrum, urban, suburban, and rural, because of the pandemic that we're under, most of us are spending more time in our homes than we did before. So if we have issues in our homes, whether it's related to radon, triggers for asthma, um, we're more exposed to those things. Um, 
are there things that your cities are doing to try to um, increase awareness of these particular issues and encouraging people to have their homes checked for these kinds of things or access the medical medical community if needed? And I'll start with Lisa this time. That can be a, a little tricky in COVID because um, we would offer to come out and do free free inspections for, for lead in houses, but people don't want you in their house. So we've gone to some virtual inspections. The one thing that we've learned just, just this month that has been really successful is the state gives us radon kits that mm -hmm. we used to um, give out the free radon kits um, at our at our permit counter. And we you know, maybe get 50 to 100 and it might take us, you know, a year to get rid of all those radon kits. We have had in the two days since we advertised that these kits are free and available and are going to be mailed out to people. We've had over 100 requests. Oh. So, so when you take down that barrier of having to come downtown in order to get the, the, mm -hmm. the free thing, um, it makes it, it may it uh, you're able to actually get the message out there and get the, the product out there. So can you describe what a virtual inspection might look like? Uh, you would call up your client and you would at because so many uh, clients now have um, the, the cell phones with FaceTime. And so they can walk oh. you around their house and show you what they're complaining hmm. about or what their concerns are. And you as the inspector can ask them, uh, can you open your window and, and show me what your window well looks like? Or, you know, can you pull out your air filter and, and show me what your furnace filter looks like. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that needs to be changed. Um, mm. So the the technology, it, and it used to be, we weren't allowed to do things. You had to be there. Right. You had to take the picture yourself in order for it to be held up legally. So it's kind of nice that the we're able to take care of the technology and that also reduces the fear um, a lot of clients are scared when somebody comes into their house that they're going to be reported to child protection. Um, but when they have control of what you see, again, that reduces the barrier and gives you the chance to um, establish that trust mm -hmm. with, with a client. So you can do some aspects of, a, of, an, of a visual inspection anyway that way. So, yep. Jen, over to you. Any thoughts on the, the risks of people spending more time in their homes? Sure. So I don't work, you know, on sort of those direct health safety issues like radon and lead necessarily. However, we have had a, a couple of things happening specifically because of COVID kind of related to that. Uh, we've seen an uptick in home energy squad visits so where they come in and do an energy evaluation of your home because they started offering them virtually. And so it was that same comfort level of, okay, I don't have to have somebody come here. I can just walk around with my phone, show them my furnace, you know, show them my equipment. Um, we did get some traction on that, certainly. The other thing that we're running into, uh, and I, you know, I don't know that we have a great answer for this yet. Um, we're starting to see people, particularly around water, but in some cases, you know, electricity and other utilities, coming in and saying, my bills are huge now. What, you know, why is my water bill so big? Well, you never really think about when you're at the office eight, 10 hours a day, how many times you go to the bathroom, right. you know, how many times, so we're seeing a lot of commentary about, you know, this water bill can't be right. And it really just reflects what it's like when you're in your home all mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Um, question came in on the chat. How are you aware of how prevalent radon is in your community? Jen, I'll start with you. I am not uh, involved in that. I would assume um, in you know the newer sections of the community, we probably have a little better radon protections than in the older uh, neighborhood, you know, more established neighborhoods. And that's the same across the metro where you kind of see these problems in the older houses and less so in the newer houses. I'm curious, Jen, as a sustainability coordinator, that was a title I really wasn't familiar with. Is, is there a network of sustainability workers that you that you know kind of can share best practices with other people? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So it's something I've been involved in this since 2008. Um, 
and I've watched it grow at the state level. Um, you know, when I first started in this field, there were maybe 10 of us and I knew everybody in every city that did it. And now that isn't remotely the case. So it's definitely grown over time at a state level. Uh, and we have sort of informal networks. Um, we have a number of really good nonprofit partners in this space uh, that kind of help facilitate uh, this collaborative work that a lot of cities are doing now around sustainability. Uh, and then at the national level, there is an organ professional organization, uh, Urban Sustainability Directors Network, where it is you know, very similar to other professional networks like your own, mm -hmm. where it's a group mm -hmm. of people that are in the same position sharing best practices and expertise and that sort of thing. That's great. Lisa, question back to you on the radon issue. How, how prevalent are you, is it in, in your community? I'm not sure of the prevalence statistics. I do know that in general, Minnesota has a lot of the, the rock naturally in our soil that releases radon gas and We've tested houses side by side, and one house will have radon, high radon, and one won't. Uh, it has to do with the fill that when they manufactured that house that they that they put around the uh, the foundation. And I'm not I'm not sure that I would say a a new house might be better, but also one of the highest radons I've seen was in a brand new house. Mm -hmm. So it's it's such a crapshoot, and you you need to test. Well, and I think I've heard too that you know new homes are so well sealed that if there is a radon issue, it's not as likely to dissipate it. So it could be more of a concern. And so everybody should be testing um, regardless of what uh, age of home they live in. Um, one last thing I thought I'd mention. So um, again, if you're following in the chat, there have been a lot of links posted there. And I'm pleased that um, MPHA will be posting those links on the website after today's session. So you'll, ha you'll have access to those. One that I posted was from the State um, Department of Transportation, MnDOT, and it's the newly released statewide pedestrian system plan. So we think of MnDOT and roads, but the pedestrian plan is very much under their jurisdiction as well. Um, and as Jen had mentioned in her opening remarks, um, even the interface between roads and streets and highways and trails um, and, and paths and things like that are part of what our communities have to plan for. There was one thing that jumped out at me when I um, skimmed over the pedestrian plan and that um, the state has chosen to refer to everybody as walkers, regardless of what form of movement they're doing, including those who are, are in wheelchairs. And that just struck me as one who works in the disability services community. I think that would be called an ableist um, approach where everybody gets lumped in and it's called a walker and those who don't have the ability to walk might take exception to that. So um, even in this kind of work, I think language um, and the way we refer to things is important. And I know that those of you who are in the planning and, sust and uh, sustainability fields are looking at equity for those of all abilities as well. That's part of the um, factors that have to be considered. So I just thought I'd put that plug in um, here at the end. This has been a really great session. And I think um, our panelists have um, done a lot to contribute to our conversation today. Thanks to all of you and for the questions that you submitted. Um, I think we've learned a lot and for sure, certainly gave me a lot of food for thought um, and to think about things differently when we look at um, what's, what's the sustainability path for our communities, whether it's urban, suburban, or rural, and um, how that interacts with public health. So I want to close with one last quote from Dr. King. He said, quote, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, end quote. And if that isn't a statement to public health, I don't know what is. So I think that's a great way to end. And with that, I will turn it back to whichever of you is going to take it from here. Me, and thank you, Ken, for those quotes. They provide a lot to think about, especially during these 
turbulent times. Um, I want to thank everyone today who took time out of their busy day to join this morning's um, forum. And a special thanks to our sponsors, friends of the forum. And finally, thank you to our panelists, Jen and Lisa, moderator Ken, um, the forum planning committee, and all those who work behind the scenes to ensure that the Zoom meeting was smoothly run. If you are not a member of Minnesota Public Health Association, I invite you to join us. Um, we are a volunteer driven organization with over 400 members strong and we've been around for over a hundred years. We are an active independent voice for public health in Minnesota. In addition to the more forums later this year, we will be holding our annual conference on April 29th and 30th. Um, for more information on our annual conference, to register for the conference, register for the forums, become a member of MPHA, or we also have nominations for leadership roles in MPHA that are open right now, um, visit our website at mpha.net. Um, hope to see you at the next Minnesota Public Health Association Forum. It's set for March 5th and we will have a new panel that will be with us to explore environmental health, is there justice for all in vulnerable populations. Stay safe everyone and have a great day and hope to see you on the 5th of March. <laughs> Bye. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Resources are awesome. Thank you. Thank you.